Well, thank you, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here earlier. Human beings are, are restless creatures. They're always on the move. They're always doing things. But far from being haphazard, these movements are, for the most part, highly controlled. And in many cases, this control is achieved through long and frequent practice. And we can then speak of it as a skill. Now, it's evident that people raised in different environments and following different ways of life possess a range of different skills. And as an anthropologist, I'm particularly concerned to understand the nature of these differences. And it's long been conventional to attribute them to something called culture. Whether culture is genuinely unique to human beings or present, albeit in rudimentary forms in non-human species, has been much debated. But there's general agreement on two points. First, humans rely on culturally acquired skills to an extent unparalleled elsewhere in the animal kingdom. And secondly, whatever biological differences may exist among human beings are irrelevant so far as their acquisition of culture is concerned. Or to put it another way, every creature born of man and woman should, in principle, be capable of acquiring the skills appropriate to any form of cultural life. One of the most significant facts about us, wrote the anthropologist Clifford Geertz many years ago, may finally be that we all begin with the natural equipment to live a thousand kinds of life, but end in the end having lived only one. Well, let me give you a couple of examples of acquired skills. It so happens that I can speak English and that I can play the cello. Now, what natural equipment do I need in order to accomplish these things? First of all, of course, I must have a body with certain built-in anatomical structures and capacities of movement. Arms and fingers for playing the cello, the vocal tract for speech. But that's surely not enough. Do I not also need a mind by means of which I am able to assimilate the specific rules and representations that I put into practice, respectively, when I play and when I speak? Many theorists of language and culture have indeed argued along precisely these lines that if rules and representations are to be passed down the generations as part of an enduring cultural or linguistic tradition, then certain cognitive devices must already be in place that enable the novice to, so to speak, decode the input of sensory data drawn from the observations of the behaviour of experienced practitioners and thereby to reconstruct these rules and representations inside his or her own head or as Roy Dandrade, one of the pioneers of cognitive anthropology, has put it, the transmission of specific cultural content in the form of programs depends upon the functioning of universal cognitive capacities capacities or processes. We're perhaps most familiar with this idea in the case of language learning, where it's supposed that the child's acquisition of his or her particular mother tongue, in my case English, depends on the pre-existence in the mind of an innate language acquisition device or LAD that is able to process the input of speech sounds so as to establish a system of grammatical and syntactical rules for the production of well-formed and comprehensible utterances. By the same token, I suppose that there ought to exist some kind of device dedicated to the construction of particular motor programs, in my place, for cello playing, from the observation of other people's movements. It seems, therefore, that to complete our picture of the linguistically and culturally unskilled human being, we have to put together three things. First, the muscular skeletal apparatus of the human body. Secondly, the hardwired processing mechanisms or computational architecture of the human mind. And thirdly, the assemblage of specific representations or programs 
whose transmission across the generations these mechanisms make possible. Now I refer to this idea of the human being as the sum of three complementary parts, namely body, mind and culture, as the complementarity thesis. It's that, as I'll show, by a formidable intellectual alliance between the theoretical paradigms of neo-Darwinism in biology, of cognitive science in psychology, and of culture theory in anthropology. Far from advocating this alliance, I intend to argue that it is dangerously misconceived. But before doing so, I should explain how its constituent parts fit together. So I begin with the biology. The central claim of Darwinian biology is that human beings, along with creatures of every other kind, have evolved through a process of variation under natural selection. Now this claim rests on a critical assumption, namely that the growth and maturation of the individual organism, that is to say its ontogenetic development, is a separate matter from the evolution of the species to which it belongs. To be sure, what an organism does during its life is both a consequence of and has consequences for the evolution of its kind. But its life history is not a part of that evolution. In its Darwinian conception, evolution is not a life process. If we ask what evolves, it's not the living organism itself, nor its manifest capabilities of action, but rather a formal design specification for the organism, technically known as the genotype. By definition, the genotype <coughs> is given independently of any particular environmental context of development. Its evolution takes place over numerous generations through gradual changes brought about by natural selection in the frequency of its information-bearing elements, the genes. Ontogenetic development is then understood as the process whereby the genotypic specification is translated within a certain environment into the manifest form of the phenotype. Now, just as neo-Darwinian biology presumes that there exists a context-independent specification of the design of the body, so in the field of psychology, cognitive science posits a similarly, similarly context-independent specification for the architecture of the mind. And this architecture includes the various cognitive mechanisms or processing devices which, as, as I've shown, would have to be in place before any kind of transmission of cultural representations could take place at all. As to the problem of where these mechanisms come from, cognitive scientists generally assume that this has already been solved by evolutionary biology. Since the information specifying the mechanisms cannot be transmitted culturally, because the mechanisms are a precondition for cultural transmission, we are left with only one possibility. This information must be transmitted genetically, that is, as one component of the human genotype. Indeed, by and large, in the literature of cognitive science, the postulation of innate mental structures is taken to require no more justification than vague references to genetics and natural selection. So, the evolved capacities of the human mind, transmitted genetically, are supposed to establish the cognitive foundations in successive generations for the acquisition of their specific content through a parallel process of cultural transmission. And that's why I've tried to show in this diagram here, here's a, here's a line of of, of, of individuals, ancestors and their descendants and um, I've denoted the, the, uh, the innate capacity as a kind of bucket which is then filled with cultural content. So the, the bucket, the, the specifications of the bucket are transmitted genetically in each generation and then it's filled with content that is again passed along the line from one generation to the next in a parallel process. <coughs> 
The final component of the trilogy then is a 